in that direction um, as nothing, nothing of the kind had ever happened, though it, it, the relationship, um, there were um, arguments and um, things of that nature, but never did I myself r reach the point of um, uh, striking Miss Heard in any way, nor have I ever struck uh, um, any woman um, in my life. And so I, <clears throat> at the time, because the news of this her accusations had uh, sort of permeated the industry and then made its way through media and social media, became quite a global um, uh, let's say quote unquote f fact, if you will. And since I knew that there was no truth to it whatsoever, I felt it my responsibility to uh, to stand up not only for myself um, in that instance, but stand up for my children, who at the time were uh, f 14 and 16. And so they were in high school and uh, I, I thought it was diabolical that my children would have to go to um, school and have their friends or people in the school approach them with the infamous People magazine cover with uh, uh, Miss Heard with a, a dark bruise on her face. Um, and then it just kept um, the it kept multiplying. It, it, it just kept getting bigger and bigger. So it was my responsibility, I felt, to not only attempt to clear my name um, for the sake of for many reasons, but I wanted to clear. Uh, my children of of this horrid thing that they were having to read about their father that was which was untrue, and also after many years of being in this um, industry um, I, at the time it was probably i'd probably been in the industry thirty plus years thirty five years um, never had had any problems or anything like that. And I had met many people over, over the years, many, many of the people, and had had the opportunity to talk to those people and to um, g even give advice to these people. And I'm, I'm not, um, my goal is the truth. My goal is the truth because it, it, it killed me that people that I had spoken with, that I had met with over the years, who, I, who maybe were in a not such a great position and they needed advice, and I gave them the best advice I could, um, all I could think of was that those people would 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 think that I um, was a fraud and that I had lied to them, and so I had to wait for my opportunity to um, address the charges, which were criminal charges, um, and 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 they, and they just weren't um, true. So I, I felt the responsibility of 
clearing the record as um, the only the only way that I could get that I could get to the point where I could speak um, has really taken this full six years and it's been six years of trying times it's very strange when one day you're uh, Cinderella so to speak and then in 0 0.6 seconds you're Quasimodo and um, I I, I, I didn't uh, deserve that, nor did my children, nor did the people who have believed in me for all these years. I, I didn't want anybody, any of those people to believe that I had done them wrong or lied to them or that I was a fraud. I, I, I'm, I pride myself on honesty. I pride myself on truth. Truth is the only thing I'm interested in. Other lies will get you nowhere, but um, lies build upon lies and build upon lies. It's too much to cover. I, I, I'm obsessed with the truth. And um, so today is my Actually, my, the first uh, opportunity that I've been able to speak about this um, case uh, in full for the, for the first time. Mr. Depp, how do you feel about the intimate details of your life being aired in this process? Um, as a father um, raising kids, you know, when they were very, very little. Um, it was important to me, very important to me, to, to try to shield my children as much as possible from um, looking at their father uh, or, their, or their mom, for that matter, uh, as uh, uh, novelties. I didn't want my children to experience um, hordes of paparazzis. Um, so I was always a very private person. Um, so for me to come up here and stand before you, or sit before you all, um, and spill the truth um, is quite exposing and um, it's unfortunate that, that it's not only exposing for myself, it's exposing for my family, it's exposing for Miss Heard, it's exposing for, it's, um, it, it never had to go in this direction and so I I can't say that I'm embarrassed because I know that I'm doing the right thing. <clears throat> now, Mr. Depp, um, I'd like to turn a bit to your upbringing. Um, we heard a bit from your sister, Christy, last week. But can you please tell the jury in your own words about your, your childhood upbringing? Um, I had a very interesting <laughs> childhood. Um, one that I thought was normal until a certain age. My mother, um, I was born in Kentucky, and um, then we moved, in which we moved around quite a lot um, when I was a kid. So you were always just, my mom had this, uh, her feet were on fire and she had to move. You know, so we moved constantly. So you were always the new kid. And that wasn't ever particularly pleasant. Then we moved to Florida, South Florida, when I was about seven or eight. Um, and again, moved several, several times. But um, my mother was 
quite unpredictable. She was very unpredictable. Um, she was a... She had the ability to be as, as cruel as anyone can be um, with all of us, uh, that is to say, my sister Christy and my, my brother Danny and my sister Debbie, and also my father. <clears throat> so, um, essentially, um, she was, uh, she could become quite violent and she was quite violent and she was quite cruel and she, and though there was physical abuse, certainly, um, which could uh, be in the form of uh, an ashtray being flung at you, you know, it, hit you in the head or you'd get beat with a high heel shoe or, or a telephone or whatever's handy. Um, so in our house, there was no, we were never exposed to any type of safety um, or security. The, the, um, the only thing that one could do, really, um, was to try to stay out of the line of fire. You, um, I started to um, be able to observe and I could see, I could start to see when she was about to head, head into a uh, would head into a, a situation where she was going to get riled up and somebody was going to get it. Um, generally, uh, it was me. Mr. Depp, you mentioned that your mother could be cruel. How could she be cruel? Um, the, well, the various categories, I suppose, are... There are, there's, there's physical violence, of course, there's physical abuse, um, to which she was, um, that was a constant. That was just a constant, you know. We were all somewhat shell-shocked, you know, even if she just walked past, you, you'd, you'd sort of shield yourself because you didn't know what was gonna happen. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, um, so there was there was the physical abuse, which was was uh, a constant. Um, there was uh, quite a lot of verbal abuse. There was quite a lot of name calling and um, bullying. You know, m making fun of making fun of whatever defect you know w w one might have. You know, if my brother wore glasses, so of course he was four eyes, or, and he had his teeth were messed up in the front, so he was buck tooth as well. Um, um, my sister Christy, which this is such a, a hideous psychological play. Uh, my, my, my father's uh, parents were quite refined. My mother comes from eastern Kentucky, which is is uh, where you grow up in shacks and hol and hollers, you, you know. And uh, my 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 mother despised uh, my father's parents. And my grandmother's name was Violet. And every now and again, you would hear my mother just scream across the house. Come here, Violet. Get in here, Violet. And Christy, my sister, knew very well that that was a, a deep, a deep cut psychologically, emotionally. But we had to take it. I mean, you, you just had to take the pain. 
Um, I, I was born with a very strange, it was a very rare uh, thing in my eye as the, the, the back of the lens is spherical, uh, normally um, is spherical, so in this eye it isn't normal. This eye I was born um, with a more conical uh, lens, so uh, my brain never learned to see out of my left eye. And they noticed when I was about uh, three, four, five, three, four, that I had a, a lazy eye, a wandering eye, and um, um, she would call me, <laughs> she would call me cockeye, one eye, um, any, anything, anything she could get to, to uh, uh, demean, humiliate. Um, uh, I even had to wear, um, I had to wear an eye patch on my good eye uh, to strengthen my, my bad eye so that it would cease to wander. It, with a mus it was exercising the muscles of the eye. Though the brain had never learned to see, so I still, uh, my vision in my left eye is, uh, I'm legally blind in my left eye. But, um, so, yeah, the, the, the verbal abuse, the psychological abuse was, uh, was almost worse than the, than the, than the, than the, the beatings. Because the beatings were just physical pain. And the physical pain, you learn to deal with. You learn to accept it. You learn to deal with it. Um, but the, uh, the psychological and emotional abuse, that's what, uh, that's what kind of tore us up, I think. What about your father? What was he like? My father, my father was a very kind man. Uh, in fact, my father's still alive. He's, he's a very kind man. Um, he's, he's a very quiet man. Um, in fact, he's very shy. Um, not a confrontational uh, person in any way. And when Betty Sue, my mother, um, would go off on 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 a tangent uh, toward my my father, um, and 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 of course in front of the kids it was no matter to her. Uh, he would he would um, he, he amazingly remained very very stoic and uh, never as she was rationing him with horrible um, things, he stood there and just looked at her while she delivered the pain, and he swallowed it. He took it. Um, there was never one moment, never a moment when my father um, lost control and attacked my mother or hit my mother or even said even said a bad thing to my mother what what I the things that I witnessed were there were a couple of times when it got too far that I I would see his I could see his eyes welling up as he was staring at her saying nothing um, and then the most that he would do is he would, he would, he would punch a, a, a wall. I, I once saw him punch a wall and um, it would shatter his hand because it wasn't it wasn't drywall. It was um, proper concrete and uh, steel wire and rebar and things of that nature. And uh, um, but still never never touched her, never um, argued with her. He, uh, 
he, he, he remained a gentleman. And to me, as a five-year-old boy, I kept thinking to myself, I kept wondering why, why does he take it? How does he, wh how does he take this? And, 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 and why doesn't he leave her? Um, but he didn't, you know. Um, he was able to maintain <clears throat> his calm and his composure. He was able to maintain uh, his relationship with his children. Um, he was uh, he was he was a good man. Uh, he is a good man. You mentioned that you saw your father punch a wall. How many times did you witness that? I mean, out of, out of, I couldn't count the amount of fights that they had, but I, I, I know that I, I've, I've seen my father strike uh, a wall um, two or three times tops. Once <clears throat> when he broke his hand. Um, but yeah, two, 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 three times at tops, you know. Was your father ever abusive to you or any of your siblings? Uh, no, my father was never, my father was not an abusive man. Um, at the same time, my father was also, um, to some degree, at the mercy of Betty Sue. Um, because if he argued with what she wanted done, that would just turn into uh, a, another um, barrage of, of, of hatred uh, towards him. So I can remember my father coming home from work and m maybe I'd, I'd, I'd gotten a bad report card or maybe I'd uh, gotten in trouble at school or um, something like that and my father would arrive home from work and the first thing she would say was John take take him out there he gets the belt give him the belt and he wanted to know what it was about so he'd take me out to the garage and uh, I'll never forget the uh, this white, thick leather 1970s era, thick leather white belt that he would um, take off, and and um, and then he would uh, commence to uh, inflict the punishment uh, on on me. Um, but interestingly, there was a, there was one time when my father. I, I kept telling him I, I didn't do this. It was another incident. I, I kept swearing to him that I, I did not do what Betty Sue, my, what my mom had said that I'd done. But he went through with the punishment anyway. <clears throat> and then, uh, not long after, he found out that I had been telling the truth and that I hadn't done what uh, I, what my mom had said that I'd done, um, and he he came to me and uh, apologized to me for um, for having gone through with the whipping, you know, with the belt. And um, I have to say, um, my mom never did that. She couldn't. She, she knew what she knew. She was raised how she was raised. And um, I had no power to change what was inside of her, you know. How did your parents' relationship ultimately come to an end to your understanding? Um, when my father left, I, I didn't realize that he had left. He left for, I, I was 15, I'd, I had already, uh, 
left school and I was a musician. I was playing in clubs and such. And uh, he left for work one morning, just like every day, and he was packing his car and then he left. And then hours later, uh, my mom, Betty Sue, came home from work. It was about 3.30 in the afternoon. And she walked in the door and stopped and, and just looked around like she felt something. And she just, I said, what's wrong? She said, your daddy's gone. I said, well, yeah, I seen him leave for work this morning. She said, no, 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 he's gone, he's gone. And she ran into the, uh, into their bedroom and into their closet and I followed her and I, she opened the door and there was one, yeah, his side, his rack of clothing and all his belongings were gone. And she was quite upset. And I took her car and drove to my father's work and I sat down in front of him at 15 and I said, listen, Seems as though somebody stole all your clothes out of the closet. And, um, and he said, uh, he said, yeah, yeah. He said, I, I'm done. I, I can't, I can't do it anymore. I can't, I can't live it anymore. You're the man, you're the man now. And uh, those words didn't, didn't quite sit well with me. I, I didn't feel like I was ready to hear those words. But that's what I got. Um, then my mom got very, went into a very, very dark uh, place, a very deep, dark depression, as you can imagine. And, um, and uh, she, one afternoon I, woke up, I'd, I'd fallen asleep, and I woke up and walked out into the living room, and I saw my, my mother, um, like, uh, very feebly, um, and like, almost, it was like a slow motion crawl. It, it, if I could stand up, I could show you, just, the, what I saw, do you mind? Do you no, want you can stand up. Thank you. Um, I saw, I saw my, my mother, you know, in that, in that mode. So instantly, I knew that something was dreadfully wrong. And um, there was, drool coming out of her mouth and as I was about to run and call the front door busted open and uh, my uncle and uh, two paramedics came in and um, threw on the gurney and whisked her out of the house to get her to the hospital to um, to pump her stomach and she'd uh, she had uh, swallowed uh, a multitude of of pills to 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 try to take herself out to, to try to commit suicide and uh, when she got out of the hospital she was a small firecracker of a woman she was about five foot two but when she got out of the hospital the depression was so deep she she was down to like she lived on the couch and she weighed about 70 pounds. And that, all that imagery spun into my head at that time that I thought that was a very, in my head at the time, I thought that that was a cowardly way for my father to have left. And I, I, I was, uh, deeply upset by that um, until my father and I had a conversation um, years later where I asked him 
what really happened, what, how did it happen when I was older. And he told me the story. Your Honor, may we approach? Sure. Mr. Duff, how did you feel about your father when he left? I would. I was. I was. I was very disappointed in him because I started to believe that his exit was was sneaky, cowardly. He didn't. When he said goodbye to me, when he left for work that morning, he said goodbye, you know, goodbye, Bob. And I went, see you later, Pop. And that was it. Until um, I learned the truth from, uh, from him. And without getting into what your father told you, why is, how, how has your um, impression of your father changed now? Objection relevance. Your Honor, this is just an understanding of his perception of his family. I'll sustain the objection. Next question. Mr. Depp, what have you learned from um, your experience in your childhood and observing your father in your childhood? I learned that I was wrong about my first impressions of his, his exit from the family, um, very wrong. And um, I'll tell you, I'll tell you one thing I, that I learned that was, that was uh, one of the best lessons I believe I've ever learned in my life, ever could learn in your life, in my life was um, based on my experiences as, as a child and what I'd seen and experienced, I knew exactly how to raise children um, when, when, uh, when my girl Vanessa got pregnant. Um, I knew exactly how to raise children, which was to do the opposite of what they did, of what Betty Sue did. Never raise your voice in front of the children, never. Um, screaming out the word no to them. I never wanted to tell my kids no. I, I, I wanted to tell them that. I wanted to show them that there were options. You don't have to stick the coat hanger in the electrical socket. You know, saying no is an abrupt thing, but to talk to them and say, if you understand the repercussions of something, then you won't go there. So maybe think about this as opposed to this. Give this some thought, you know, but that will clearly um, that could kill you. So I, I would ease them away from um, 
things of that nature with a more more of an more of a conversation as opposed to a a a you know a flat out don't you ever do that again and threats and things of that nature I, I did not raise my children that way nor nor did Vanessa we and we never raised our voices in front of our children ever how do you and think your experiences with your parents in your childhood affected your approach to your relationship with Miss Hurd? I'm sorry, um, one more time. How did your experiences observing your parents as a child affect your approach to your relationship with Miss Hurd? Well, in the beginning of my relationship with Miss Hurd, um, there was, from what I recall and what I remember, she was, she was, um, it was as if she were, it was, she was too good to be true. Um, she was attentive, she was loving, um, she was smart, she was kind, she was funny, she was understanding, she, um, and, and we, we, we had many things in common, certain blues music and, well, music, literature, things of that nature, so for that year or year and a half, it was, uh, it was amazing. Um, there were a couple of things that, I don't know, stuck in my head that I noticed that I thought might be a little bit of a, a dilemma at some point. For, for example, <clears throat> if I, if I, 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 was, I worked quite a lot, and when I would come home from work, um, I would, I would come in the house or the hotel and she would sit me down on the couch and give me a glass of wine and uh, take my boots off, set them to the side and, um, I've never experienced anything like that. In, in, in my life, I, I, I just never thought that was, I just never experienced that before. And it became a regular thing um, that she did, uh, this kind of routine. And I remember one night I came home from work and, uh, and I think she was on the phone or something and or busy, she was doing something. And um, so I sat down on the couch and I took my boots off and um, suddenly, Miss Hurd approached with this look on her face, that, that she, and she just said, "What did you just do? What did you do?" I said, what, what, "What do you mean? You took your boots off." I said, I said "Yeah, yes, I did. You, 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 you were busy, you know." No, no, no. That's my job. That's what I do. You don't do that. I do that. Okay. All right, then. And then she said, let me get you a glass of wine. And she brought me the glass of wine. But I did take pause, of course, at the fact that she was visibly shaken or upset that I had... Uh, I had broken her rules of routine. I thought that strange. And then once that, once you notice something like that, then you start to notice other little tidbits and things that come out. And then, and then uh, within a year, year and a half, she had become this another person, almost. 
Mr. Depp, we're going to talk about Ms. Hurd in a, a couple minutes, but I'd like to first talk about um, your career in Hollywood. And so could you please tell the jury how you ended up acting in the first place? Um, I ended up acting by accident. I uh, was a musician and I'd moved out to Los Angeles with my band uh, when I was 20 years old. Um, and then there were a couple of uh, things that happened in the band where the band split up. And uh, I remember I was filling out job applications and then Nick, uh, uh, with a friend of mine who happens to be, he, happened, he was an actor uh, less known then than he is now, Nicolas Cage. Um, and I was filling out job applications at any, you know, video stores, clothing stores, anything, you know, just to be able to pay the rent. And um, Nick Cage said, uh, you know, wh why don't you meet my agent, you know, because uh, I, I, I think you're an actor. I think you could be an actor. And I said, look, I, I'll meet anybody, you know. I'll do anything at this point. And so he sent me to his his agent, Eileen Feldman, and I met with her. Um, she sent me to read for a, uh, a casting director named Annette Benson, who was casting a film called The Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, and uh, they brought me back to read for the director, Wes Craven. And um, I read for Wes uh, Craven, and somehow got the job. But I mean, I was by no means an actor. I didn't have any desire to be an actor. I was a musician. Uh, but the fact that these people were going to pay me what I found to be a ludicrous sum of money, which was, uh, it was kind of the SAG minimum uh, it was $1,284 a week, which I, I mean, you know, I'd never seen that kind of dough before in my life. Um, and so I, I suddenly, you know, and then I did some other couple of dumb movies because I, I, I still, in my mind, I was a musician, and this was just a way to uh, pay the rent, pay the bills, live. Um, then suddenly I found myself on that road. I had been placed on that road uh, as, a, as an actor. And, and then I, one thing led to another from film to film, and then I uh, was cast in a TV series called 21 Jump Street when I was 22, I believe. Mr. Depp, between the time that you um, were cast in Nightmare on Elm Street and you um, were cast in 21 Drums, Jump Street, mm -hmm. how did you enjoy acting during that time? It was foreign to me. It was foreign to me, but I, I, didn't, I, di I didn't have any great ambition to be an actor. I, I'm a, a naturally, normally, I'm, I'm a, I've always been quite a shy person. I've always been quite introverted. And so there was a very strange metamorphosis from being one of four that is to say, one of four in a band where you have this fraternity or this brotherhood, um, and you're out there fighting the world together to try to get that record deal or whatever you're looking for. And uh, when the when when I got on the series, and my life started to change in various ways. That is to say, that people started to. You know, you go into a restaurant and you'd see people whispering and pointing and all that. I, I was, uh, 
I was very uncomfortable with it. I was very uncomfortable with it, and I didn't like it. Um, just just because it, I, I, ne I never wanted to be the lead singer and the guy out front and uh, we'll get all the attention. And I, I didn't. So suddenly I was on my own, and I was uh, having to deal with this. Uh, this, this this newfound sort of notoriety, and it was it was odd. It was very odd, and it was yeah, it was a very uncomfortable thing. I, I mean, it, I don't think it's anything that one can get used to. I don't. I, I wouldn't. I'm not. I'm still not used to it now. And I, which I'm actually glad that I'm not used to it, because if I were, uh, I don't think I'd be the same person that I am. Mr. Depp, did there come a time when you became passionate about acting? Once I realized that, I, that that's the road that I was on and that any attempt at going back to music would, would be a, um, a, a, a not, it would have been, I hated the idea that since the television series had come out and I had been exposed as this, this, this character or this actor, uh, um, I had to realize in, in my own mind and heart that there was no going back to music because I, I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to use whatever amount of success that I had um, attained from the TV series and that sort of thing, I didn't want to use that to influence, um, you, you know, some career in music. I, I, I had far too much respect for uh, music um, than to just uh, become what they wanted me to become, which was a you know, teen idol or a teeny you know that that's that sort of thing. I um, I fought that with uh, with everything in my being. So once I realized that music was no longer uh, an option, then um, I began to uh, study. Um, at various places, you know, the Loft Studio, which is now long gone um, in, in Los Angeles. I, I studied with uh, some other teachers, uh, Sandra Seacat. Um, I read all the books that you could read, and all that was great, but um, you realize that the only way to the only way to l l learn or, or the, the only way to learn how to it's not act necessarily the only way to learn how to react and behave because it's just behavior and it's reaction um, was to do it. It, it you it's on the job training it's trial by fire so um, I did my best to to work up work my work up my own approach towards the towards uh, a character and such. And what were a couple of the first few uh, projects that you worked on where you were really able to implement that approach? I would say. I, I, I would say that the, fir the f first film that I had done that I really took um, where I really felt, okay, I've done the work, I, 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 I know what I need to do. Um, I would say that was that, that where I considered myself an actor, I suppose, was, was, was when... Um, Oliver Stone cast me in uh, 
platoon in 1986. How did you come to be cast in Pirates of the Caribbean? Uh, well, that's, that's many years later, but uh, I, I had been, um, Disney had offered me a film um, called Hidalgo, I, I, when it was a, about a man and his horse in the desert and stuff, and I, I, I read the, uh, the screenplay and I just didn't think it was for me. Um, but I wanted to have a meeting with them because I, at that point I had a um, two-year-old, uh, yeah, two-and-a-half-year-old two, two and a half year old daughter, and so, or three, and, 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 and for three years I watched nothing but animated films, uh, uh, cartoons from Tex Avery to Bugs Bunny to um, that, 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 that was all I, I, I watched with my with my little girl and I received the screenplay for Pirates and it was uh, I, I somehow in my mind I saw this opportunity, like a, a way to mesh characters like, car like cartoon characters. For example, Wile E. Coyote gets a boulder dropped on his head and he's completely crushed, but in the, they cut to the next scene and he's just got a little bandage on his head. So I, I started thinking about the, the parameters uh, that are that were available to cartoon characters, and if they were available to cartoon characters, and 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 nobody ever asked a question whether you were five or ninety-five, you didn't ask a question. Oh, Wiley Coyote! Of course, he's still alive. So I tried to incorporate these uh, these kind of ideas into the character of Captain Jack Sparrow so that so, 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 so that I could try to push those parameters and 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 control the sort of suspension of disbelief the, to be able to control the um, characters actions words movements and put them in a place where the things that he would do or say were so either ludicrous or um, mainly something that also something to, to, the cartoon characters can get away with things we can't. Captain Jack Sparrow can do things that I could never do. He could say things that I could never say. So it was for me a way to stretch the parameters of, of a character and uh, uh, and take uh, take a risk uh, in doing that. But if it if it panned out, I, 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 and I felt I was on a pretty good mission. If it panned out, I thought that it might be a character who would be accepted by five-year-olds and. 45-year-olds and 65-year-olds and 85-year-olds and in the same way that Bugs Bunny is, uh, you know, you mentioned that you, Sorry. You mentioned mm. that you received the script. When was that? I'm sorry? When did you first receive the script for Pirates of the Caribbean? Uh, the, the, the first screenplay I, I, I received was uh, 2002, I believe. Yeah, 2002. And what did you think of that script when you received it? Um, I thought that it had all the kind of hallmarks of a of a of a Disney film. That is to say, a kind of a predict predictable <coughs> predictable three act structure um, with uh, 
with and the character of Captain Jack was was more um, he was more like a swashbuckler type that would kind of swing in shirtless and you know be the hero um, and I I had quite different ideas about the character so I incorporated my notes into the character and brought that character to life, um, much to the chagrin of Disney, initially. Now, when you say you made changes to the character, how did you do that? Um, just, you know, in, in preparation, you know, the, 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 the same, the very same way that I've ever approached any character, you, you, you look for a back history, you base it on, um, you know, it could be anything, like Edward Scissorhands, for example, was I based on a, a dog that I'd had and uh, newborn babies. My sister had, had a couple of new babies and I watched them, you know, and I, because I thought that Edward would see things from the, the sort of, Un uh, the, uh, from a place of innocence um, and n not knowing exactly what things meant or were and, and also that, that look of uh, a, a pure innocent child when they experience something for the first time um, those, those were the the two main ingredients that I th thought would Being able to, it's not like you become that person, but if you, if you know that character, it, it, to the degree that I did, because he was not what the writers wrote, so they really weren't able to write for him. So once you know a character better than the writers, that's when you um, you have to uh, uh, be true to the character and add your words, add, add, the, add the rewrites. Um, I was, uh, I, yeah, no, I, I, I believed in the character wholeheartedly and the, uh, initially the Disney uh, folks were somewhat upset. Now, you mentioned that the film was, to your understanding, a great success. How did your life change after the first Pirates of the Caribbean movie came out? Um, though I'd been around for many years already, and, uh, and uh, people, people knew who I was and all that, um, after Pirates 1 came out, there was a, a, a completely different, it was a completely different uh, way of life was, was, was being sort of, you know, my family and I were being plunged into. 
That is to say, you know, at our house in Los Angeles, you would have you would have people trying to climb the gates to get into see Captain Jack Sparrow. Um, you would you would have people trying to bust in the gates dressed as Captain Jack Sparrow. You would have it, it and follow you or follow you and your family. So that was that was the moment when. Um, the, the, there was no other way but to uh, we we had to hire more security guards and I was certainly worried for my kids um, safety and so then we that's when the instead of just the one guy there were there, you know there were start, there became several security people because I wanted to make sure that my kids were safe when they went to school or when they went to Disneyland or when they went to the mall or whatever. Um, so yes, more security and, you know, then just getting followed, you know, by hordes of paparazzi and things like that. It's, 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 uh, I've had worse jobs, certainly. I can't complain about it. But, um, yeah, uh, after a while you realize that uh, um, anonymity uh, has left the building a long time ago. You know, anonymity's gone. Um, and that's, a, that's an odd thing to deal with um, when you just, I mean, you can't just drive down to the diner and get a cup of coffee or something, it's not uh, possible. It, it, it turns into something else altogether. So it's, you know, it's acceptance. And there's, of course there's a bit of sacrifice uh, involved. I, I, I can't complain about the uh, work that I've been given. I can't complain about any of that. Um, I have no right to. Um, but it, it, it does make you have to think very creatively with when you've got little kids about how to take them to the park or, to, you know, to the swings or to the this or that, or a movie, or, you know, it becomes, a, it becomes a strategic mission. And, 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 and that's what happened after Pirates. Now, you mentioned your family. Who did your family consist of at that time? M M Vanessa um, Paradis, the mother of my children. Um, who we were together for f 14, 15 years. Um, myself, uh, our daughter, Lily Rose, and um, our boy, Jack. Now, you mentioned hiring more security. Did you already have a security team at the time that Pirates of the Caribbean came out? I'd had, I, yes, because there had been, there'd been more films prior to that, I mean, a number of films prior to that, so uh, I was, I was, uh, recognized and I was known so if you wanted to attempt to have any experience that might be normal you, you sort of had to have somebody around to uh, get you out of a squirrely situation should it arise so I had security prior to that f for who would travel with myself and my family um, but not like, you know, when I was at work, I, back then I didn't have security at work so much, you know, and it, not before Pirates. Pirates was really the, uh, that was the thing that everything, um, it, it all turned around. It all just went, went, uh, weird. So how did your security team change after Pirates of the Caribbean came out? Well, like I said, with anything, it, it had it, it become more strategic, and you had to have more guys, 
or gals, uh, because um, because if if Vanessa, if Vanessa, for example, she worked in France quite a lot, and if she was in France, um, and and I was in L.A. with the kiddies, then. Um, and working, um, security would uh, w security would basically pick my kids up at school or whatever and bring them home. So that became the routine: driving them to school, bringing them home. Um, um, so, 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 so yeah, and then if I went somewhere. So, so the, it just the security guards kind of multiplied because you needed to protect your street, your house, your kids. Endless. So after Pirates of the Caribbean, who has been on your security team? Um, Jerry Judge was was with me for. Oh boy, over 20 years. Um, Jerry Judge uh, is, is you, we've mentioned it before, he, um, uh, it was a year or two ago, he, um, he, he, Jerry would go on film sets with me, he would, he would do reconnaissance missions, you know, that is to say he would go to a country before we would go there, make sure all the hotel rooms were all taken care of and such. Um, or when I went on tour with, uh, say, the Hollywood Vampires, uh, um, which is a, a, a band that I played with, um, he would come on the road with me with another security um, guard. Uh, so there was Jerry Judge, there was Malcolm Connolly, who's been with me for 20 years or more. Um, Leonard Damien, Sean Bett, um, Travis uh, McGivern, um, Mark Gibbs. I, I mean, there are a few. Are all of these uh, security personnel still with you today? Jerry has gone on to uh, somewhere else. He's. Jerry made, uh, Jerry, Jerry passed away uh, from cancer, so Jerry, Jerry made his exit. Um, but the majority of those, no, the, the, I believe all of those fellows are still with me, yes. When did Mr. Judge pass away? I, th I believe it was two, two years ago, roughly. Maybe a little less than two years ago. Um, now I'd like to go through a couple of the names that you just mentioned. Um, what is Malcolm Conley's purview in in the realm of your security team? What is his role? Exactly. Yes. Um, well, uh, now that Jerry is um, J Jerry and Malcolm had worked together for a very long time. So I'd met Malcolm through Jerry. Um, after, after Jerry's passing, Malcolm obviously took over um, for Jerry. And so he would, uh, he would, uh, he took on extra responsibilities. He would have to make sure that there was someone on the ground wherever we were going that had done their, their uh, um, recon, you know, the reconnaissance, and to make sure that uh, um, everything was set up by the time we got there and that it would be a straight shot into the hotel without a gaggle of paparazzi. Um, you know, you didn't have to walk through. 50 screaming, hollering photographers. So, you, you know, you'd go in through a garage door and 
through a slippery kitchen and you were, then you were taken to your room where you stayed. <laughs> when, did, uh, when did Malcolm Conley join your team? Malcolm had joined, I mean, Jerry brought him on, so Malcolm has been with me for over 20 years uh, now. And so in those 20 years, how often have you physically been present with Malcolm? With Malcolm? Endless, countless, all over the world, um, all over the world, uh, everywhere. Los Angeles, J Japan, um, Serbia, um, you know, films, tour. Um, Malcolm was my, uh, he, you know, he, 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 when we were on the Vampires tour in Europe, throughout Europe, and Malcolm was on the bus with me. We, we lived on the bus together, basically. How often is Malcolm in L.A. with you? It, it depends if, if there's a, or if there was a, a, a larger premiere, you know, where, um, you know, where it, it had to be worked out so that it didn't turn into a chaotic, uh, and or dangerous event because sometimes there are between you and the people there are these barriers and uh, sometimes the professional uh, photographers or the professional autograph people will surge forward and in the front rows of these behind these barriers you have you have little kids and older women and older men and so when the professionals would surge forward these people would start getting kind of crushed against the this metal deterrent and um, that 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 was the that was the most uh, worrisome thing when you, when 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 you're at a premiere and there are thousands and thousands of people there and I've always called it running the gauntlet essentially what it is is that people are there to um, to say hi and to support uh, the film or the cast or whatever so I um, have always gone out and and signed for those people I've always gone out and signed for all or as many as I possibly could. I mean, to the point of sometimes Jerry Judge would literally pick me up off the ground to make me stop signing and take me away. Um, um, so, yeah, uh, it was uh, those 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 kind of things again. You don't you don't really get used to that, you know. Um, so I, I forget what the original part of your question was. I got lost in the gauntlet. Uh, I'll move on. What uh, what about well, Sean Bed? How long is you want to go ahead and make a, take a break now? Would that be okay for afternoon That's break? Fine. That's Let's fine. Go, why don't we go ahead and, and do that, ladies and gentlemen? We'll go ahead and take our afternoon break. Please do. Uh, we'll take fifteen minutes. Do not discuss. Uh, the case and do not do any outside research, okay? Thank you. Stay there for a minute. Sir, just a reminder, since you're on the witness stand now, you cannot discuss your testimony with anybody to include your attorneys, okay? All right. And let's come back. I guess we can come back at uh, 3.35. Is that okay for everybody? Okay. We'll take a recess. Thank you. Thank you. All right.
We're ready for the jury. Yes. have a seat, sir. All right, your next question. Uh, Mr. Depp, I'd like to just briefly go through the security personnel that you just listed out before we took a break. Um, how long has Leonard Damien be, been with you? My, my kids are now 20, 23. Leonard's, Leonard Damien's been with me, I believe. Roughly the same time as Mr. Bett, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 16, 17 years. I, uh, I, yeah, I can't be precise, but they were very young. My children were very young when, when they uh, joined the team, which was re really after Pirates was released in 2003, the first. Now you mentioned your children. Is it, what is uh, Mr. Damien's role with respect to your children's security? Excuse me. You mentioned your children yes. with respect to Leonard Damien. Is his role in connection with your children's security? Uh, y yes, very much so. Leonard, um, <clears throat> Leonard is yes, Leonard Damien, and. Um, and Sean Bett for, for uh, uh, quite a while, were both um, sort of assigned, as it were, to, to my kids, um, uh, taking them to school, picking them up from school if, if uh, Vanessa and I were unable to do it. Or even if we were there, we would drive with them um, to take the kids to school. Um, and over the, the years, obviously, your, your children, uh, my children have, have uh, taken uh, quite a shine to, to, to them. And they've become like um, another set of parents, in a way. And how long has Travis McGivern been with you? Travis, I believe, a little bit l less than that. I believe. I, I, I couldn't. I couldn't really speculate. Uh, if it's a little less, maybe it's th thirteen years. Or, I don't know. Now you mentioned that you had to bring on additional security after Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, yes. How has the fame associated with that, the, that franchise affected your, your personal relationships? Um, again, I, 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 I would never complain about the, re, the repercussions, let's say, or yeah, the, the repercussions of um, the success of that film um, but of course as i said there are sacrifices that w one <clears throat> one has to make um, sacrifices that you're you're not nearly ready for um, 
just simply when when you check into a when you go to a town or you go on a press tour or something and you're staying in a hotel people stay in hotels all the time i stay <laughs> i stay in the hotel i it's it's uh, we've found that it's just a lot easier if i stay put in a hotel and um not kind of again especially if it's with the kids or something i don't want them to I, i've never wanted them to see me as as a novelty i just wanted to be dad you know um now they're well aware of uh, a lot and uh, they're well aware of pretty much everything um but no you, you you know you when you get when you get recognized uh wherever you go um the, the the basic the basic truth is it's 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 pretty simple people are generally kind and curious um and if if you've if if they've grown up with you in their living room um from a television series or from various films that that they've seen um there's there's nothing menacing about being recognized or sometimes it can be sometimes people can get go get weird and but but uh um we've found that it's, it's just uh it's it's better all around if if i um stay in my hotel room and uh and don't go out uh to too many restaurants or anything because it, it generally causes a bit of a hubbub if you go to a restaurant someone calls the paparazzi and you go in for a meal and you come out and there's 30 guys out there it's uh it can be um a little overwhelming it's not it's not something i think i said it before it's it's not something that i that that, that it's not something that i've ever gotten used to and it's something that i hope i never get used to um because i i don't think of myself in those terms i used to be um i used to be johnny if 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 that makes sense i used to be johnny and then my name full name which i i i honestly find still it's difficult it's, if i it's uncomfortable to say my own name because i when when i say it i hear the commodity and i hear the product so i just i went from johnny to johnny depp and um and then that name um with that name johnny depp and some image was cultivated um certainly not by me but 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 uh, the 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 media um especially in those days they they must label you they have to give you a label um and labels are one of the things that i've fought vigorously with regard to my work i i i never wanted to be um <clears throat> the poster boy i never w- wanted to be the uh i don't have I, you know i'm not built with that kind of hubris i don't i don't have that kind of uh uh, uh confidence I, i i can do virtually anything playing a character 
I can become the character in my work, um, and that character may be able to he may be able to spit out a hundred words a minute, but me myself, Johnny, I uh, cannot. <laughs> So the, the, therein lies the difference, you know. Mr. Depp, other than acting, what other artistic pursuits do you have that may be a little less known to the general public? Well, I've remained uh, a, a musician. I've been a musician. Um, I started playing the guitar when I was 12 years old. And uh, that saved my life because I locked myself into a, in, in my bedroom um, at the age of 12, uh, listening to, r r you know, records, moving the needle back and then learning that piece and then learning it again. So, uh, so much so, to, I mean, th that I, 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 I don't remember, uh, I, I, I have no memory of going through puberty. I, I, I uh, I was just playing the guitar. I was just, I was obsessed with uh, my guitar. Any other artistic pursuits? Um, I, yeah, I mean, I've always drawn since I was very small, since I was very little, um, and always enjoyed drawing, and then began to paint, um, and so, they started learning about painting and trying to um, um, it, it, I suppose different ways of, of expressing oneself different ways to different ways to um, release um, the things that are living in, in, in your head, whether they be beautiful memories, whether they be horrific memories, whether they be, um, I, I, I have a, um, I, I need to create, it's, it's a need, it's a, of course, I want to create as well, but I, I, I actually need to create because I need to summon whatever whatever it is that I need to summon to whether and whether that's within a film or a, a painting or a guitar note. Um, all of those things sh should come from a place. Uh, of, of the, an organic place, a place of truth. Um, because if they don't, well, then you're just lying, aren't you? I, I, every bit of truth, a person doesn't have to say anything on film. Um, What's important is what's behind the eyes. And if they do say something, what's important is not necessarily the words that they say. It's very easy to say, I love you. But what brings it into the realm of truth is what's underneath it, what's not being said, the subtext, if you will. So. Um, any artistic or creative venture, any film, anything that I do, that's, um, that's where I'm coming from. That's, that's my approach. Mr. Duff, you mentioned words, and I think the jury has already seen um, some words that you've written in text messages. Yes. Um, can you please tell the jury a little bit about how you write? Certainly, I um, when I was young, when I was about twelve years old, my my elder brother, um, Danny, um, 
walked into my room and ripped the Peter Frampton record off my record player, threw it across the room, and said, you got to stop listening to this stuff. And he put this record on, and it started, and I'd never heard anything like it. It was called uh, Astral Weeks by Van Morrison. So I'm a kid, you know, 12 years old. So my brother had turned me on to Van Morris, and then he turned me on to soundtracks like Clockwork Orange or uh, um, um, Last Tango in Paris. Or, um, he turned me on to books by Jack Kerouac. He turned me on to books by Ginsberg, um, Philip K. Dick. I mean, he, Salinger, I mean, the whole James Joyce, the whole Hemingway, the whole thing. So. Um, so I became very interested in vocabulary and and the 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 unique voices of these writers, um, and then I started reading people like Tom Robbins and Hunter S. Thompson, and then ended up becoming very close uh, friends with with um, with Hunter. Thompson f for the last uh, 10, 12 years of his life. And uh, Hunter's writing, of course, because of the amount I spent, uh, of time I spent with him, it has influenced my writing uh, greatly. Hunter was known for inventing a thing called gonzo journalism, which is, it's, it's, it's uh, the author putting himself in the situation um, uh, as opposed to writing it from the author's point of view. He writes it with him in it. Um, and it, it, there are great um, embellishments, and uh, embellishments are great sort of ways that he would twist things and um, express um, his, 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 his feelings. Um, and so he, he became a huge hero, of course, to me, and a, a great friend. I, uh, uh, in my texts and in my emails, or sometimes just even in my writing, um, you do, you take, you, you, you take the subject and you, um, try to express it in your own vernacular and, and in that, um, as, for example, with the text messages that, that, that I apologize that everyone's had to uh, experience. I am ashamed of, uh, of some of the references uh, made. I'm uh, embarrassed that at the time, the heat of the moment, um, the heat of uh, the pain um, that I was feeling, um, went to went to dark places. There is no if you're writing, there is no set place that you have to stay in. You can travel, and sometimes. Um, Pain can be, has to be dealt with, with humor. And sometimes dark, very dark humor. Um, I, I, I grew up watching Monty Python, I, I, you know. So yes, it, it, it can tend to get into dark uh, humor. It can uh, tend to get, uh, um, words are used that for emphasis um, and 
words are used to express what what you're feeling at the time and um, it's just like growing up you learn from those mistakes you learn from those things and um, you move forward you know um, and that that's how you that's how you start to understand your own vernacular and what's important, you know, what's necessary and what's not necessary. Um, I tend to be quite expressive in my writing and after, um, <clears throat> after the uh, after the unfortunate um, words of M Ms. Hurd, um, um made their way into my heart um, and my head. Those are those are two very opposing things so you're you're trying to you you you're trying to find the best way to express something to a friend sometimes you're exaggerating uh, you know something that you've done um um just to make it sound just to make him understand that I, I, you know i'm on i'm on planet question mark here <laughs> I don't know what's going on, and I, but I know I'm in this situation, and I know that it cannot continue. Mr. Depp, the, the jury's heard quite a bit from Ms. Hurd's side about your drug and alcohol use, but I'm sure they'd like to hear from you. So could you please just tell them about your history of substance use? Certainly. Um, again, this, this goes back to when I was a, a young boy, um, excuse me, um, at about the age of, I don't know, four or five years old, I, I can remember vividly my, my mom telling me to go get her nerve pills, you know, um, out of her purse that was hanging on the back of the door. So I'd go get the nerve pills and I'd bring her the nerve pill, she'd take it. And, um, you know, after a few years, you start to notice, well, you start to think about nerve pills, nerve pills. <laughs> and then she seemed to calm down after she took those nerve pills so when i was 11 years old um i wanted to calm down and i didn't know how to so i i'd bring my mom her nerve pill i would walk away and i would take one myself um, to escape caring so much, feeling so much, uh, to escape the, the, the chaotic um, nature of, of, what, of what we were living uh, through. Um, so that, that, that was the beginning when I realized that nerve pills calm the nerves. Um, pretty young age to do that. I, uh, I can't say that I'm proud of admitting to that, but, but I, I have to say that I knew not 
what else to do. I knew nothing else that I could do. Um, so as we were all growing up, there was always those kids who would say, let's party. Let's go party. I want to party. I've never used the word party in my life. I've never, I've never taken any substance uh, for a party. I have taken these substances over the years on and off um, to numb, to numb myself of, of, uh, of the, the ghosts, the wraiths that were still with me and um, from, from, from my youth. So um, it, it, I needed, yeah, I, 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 they were, everything, it, it was essentially, it was just self-medication. Um, one of those get me out of here moments and the, you know where you want to escape from is your own brain your own head how often have you used substances throughout your life um having started with my, my mother's nerve pills at 11 of course the, the, the you know that's around the age that um you're introduced to uh, marijuana um, you're introduced to, and also depending on the, where you're living and who you're um, associating with, and who's around the neighborhood. Um, I no, I wasn't shy to uh, try a substance for to see if the effect of it would maybe even take a bit more of the edge off. So I, I, I started um, at 11 and I, I mean, I, I even mentioned this in an interview in TV Guide, if anyone remembers TV Guide, um, in 1989, where I was asked by the journalist um, why I believed that um, kids who were watching the show 21 Jump Street about police officers in school under, as un undercover, uh, undercover cops, but, uh, but as students, um, I was asked why people, why these kids or whoever should, should, should believe me or trust me or listen to me and I said look I I I could because I've experienced it and I can tell them that there is no future in it that there's nothing but a a a, a kind of an, a postponing of the inevitable that one day you're going to have to face those feelings. One day you will meet those, let's call them uh, demons, um, from your youth. Um, so I, I was, I was, I was straight up, open and honest at, at that time. In 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 a very, I mean, TV Guide was. Uh, it was right at the register when you checked out at the grocery store. It was like the most popular thing, and, and it was a very straight magazine, uh, little magazine. But I, 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 I told them I'd pretty much done all the drugs that I was aware of by the time I was 15 years old, um, and which was true. Um, now, that doesn't mean to say that I continued into that, you know, forest of, of uh, possibilities with regard to substances. Um, I wasn't uh, um, dropping acid every five minutes. I wasn't, 
I, I, there were many years that I didn't touch it, substance and no drugs. There were many years that I uh, didn't have a drink. Um, so it's, as I said, it, it, it's never been for the sort of party effect. It's been for trying to numb the things inside that have, that, 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 that plague, that, that can plague plague someone's, uh, uh, who's, who's experienced trauma. Um, but it, the, the characterization um, of, of, of the, the characterization of my substance quote unquote substance abuse um, that's been delivered by uh, Ms. Hurd is, is, uh, is, 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 a, is grossly embellished. Um, and I'm sorry to say, but um, a lot of it is, uh, it's just plainly false. I think that it was easy. It was an easy. Uh, I think it was an easy target for her to hit because once you've trusted somebody for a certain amount of years and you've told them all the secrets of your life, um, that information then, of course, can be used against you especially if it's taken to a point that is teetering on impossible, uh, uh, and teeters over impossible, in fact, at times. It's so I, I, I am not um, some maniac who needs um, to be high or loaded all the time. I, I in fact, the, 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 in Australia, from before Australia and in Australia, I had been um, off, off of alcohol for I believe it was about 18 months. Mr. Jeff, you've mentioned some periods of sobriety throughout your life. How many would you estimate you've had? Uh, quite, uh, quite a number. Uh, you know, it, it, on, on various films, you see, um, I, I suppose, I, I guess maybe by example, if, if anyone's, uh, well, if you're familiar with Hunter Thompson's book, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, which I, I was uh, lucky enough to make uh, into a film and, and, uh, with Terry Gilliam. The, the film calls for myself and my attorney to be absolutely blotto out of our heads constantly uh, throughout the film. And most people just assume that well, they just got wasted and they filmed them. There would have been no way to, you couldn't act that. You couldn't, I mean, you couldn't make that film with two actors who were loaded. There would be no way. Um, and then to the other extreme, Donnie Brasco, uh, a film that I made about a, an FBI agent. I, I, I had to, uh, uh, I had to go, in, go into a training regime where I, I, I had to eat five meals a day, drink five shakes a day, you know, these protein shakes per day, um, work out three to four hours a day because I had to gain 20 to 30 pounds of muscle. Uh, um, uh, there was certainly no abuse of um, substances 
uh, then. Uh, I, there's been no abuse of substances on film sets. There have been no, uh, there's been no, there's been no moments where I would have been considered out of control, never. In fact, it's not been mentioned, that I'm sure they don't want to mention it, but I remember that because we, when I was with Ms. Hurd, um, and her friends, and we were all drinking wine, um, and I smoking um, marijuana. Um, they would, they used to tease me because the, because of uh, what they said was a, a, a ludicrous tolerance because I because I never appeared bloated or high or any of that. I, I, I um, even, if, even if I felt a little spinny, I know, it, no one would have ever known. You know. Mr. Depp, is there any substance that you've ever been addicted to? Yes. And, and what is that? Um, Roxycodone, or Roxycotton, which is, um, it's an opiate. It's, um, I, think, I think Oxycodone has the opiate and then some pain, like paracetamol or something, and, and then the Roxys are just the opiate as far as I uh, remember and um, when I was I was working on Pirates 4 and uh, there there was a scene in which I had to um, grab this large gold and uh, gold and red you know stately gilt chair pick it up and throw it chuck it out this uh, big giant window. And so I did it. And as I swung around to throw the, throw the chair out the window, um, I felt this immediate electricity from, from the bottom of my spine down to, down my left leg. Um, and it was like an electricity that burned. It, 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 it. So I had obviously done it was sciatica, so I had obviously pinched something, done something. So I went to, I saw a chiropractor or a kine or whatever. I saw chiropractors and, and uh, to no avail. Uh, then I saw a doctor and, and uh, the only pain medication that she uh, recommended and prescribed to me was uh, uh, roxycodone. Um, and uh, there was a part of me that was a little bit w w worried, it, it just in a sense that I, I, I know um, I witnessed uh, friends and People over the years who have um, who've had problems with uh, heroin, you know, um, and I, I didn't want to get bit by that snake, and I started taking the Roxies, and uh, I was bit by the snake, and then before you know it, um, that. That monkey is on your back to stay. And it's not like you take those pills to get high. You, you take them to, once, once, once the addiction has grabbed hold of you, 
you, you're not taking those pills to get high. You're, you're taking those pills to get uh, uh, well or to get better. Because if you're without the pill, your body will start to go into various uh, you'll, you'll withdrawals. And um, so I was, I was on the Roxy, Roxy's for a number of years, uh, four or five years, I think, maybe more, I don't know. But um, the key was that I, I, if you take two, you will be um, what they call on the knot. You will be that. You'll, you will just drop into sleep. Um, uh, so, um, yes, I, I, I didn't like being dependent on on these on these pills. I didn't like being dependent on on um, a, on a drug that would you take only so you wouldn't get withdrawals. That's what it becomes. It's like a junkie. The, the reason why so many, uh, well, now there's a huge fentanyl problem, but, but the reason why junkies generally, why they ended up overdosing is because they're looking for the first high again. And you, you don't get that. You don't get your first high again. So what do you do? You up the stakes, and you put more, you take more. And, and that's what makes uh, them, that's what makes things go dark for them. Because they overestimated the amount that they, that their body could tolerate. And they go blue, and they die. So, um, yeah. Didn't want that. Mr. Depp, do you have an estimate as to what year you started taking the, the opiates that you just described? Um, when, uh, 2000, or excuse me, uh, it was pirates. Bless you. Four, I believe. Pirates four. No, it was pirates four. Rob Marshall directed it. Um, I don't know what year that was. M m maybe. I actually don't, I have no idea what year that was. Was it before you were in a relationship with Ms. Hurd? Yes. I believe so. And you didn't detox, and you detoxed from those opiates during your relationship with Ms. Hurd. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so they, of course, yes. So they must have, yeah, they did come around prior to my meeting, Ms. Hurd. After you detoxed from the opiates, have you ever taken any opiates ever again? No, I can't. That's a, uh, no. Once you've been bit, you'll be bit again. So no, I, with any, I mean, even with my, finger uh, I, I think that it was like Mot Motrin 800 uh, uh, you know but n no opiates no I have not taken an opiate since and I won't un unless I plan on going through the the hell of the, the pure horror of detoxing, of coming off those drugs. No. no. Mr. Depp, I'd like to now turn to your relationship with Ms. Hurd. Um, can you please tell the jury how you met Ms. Hurd? Mm -hmm. um, 2000, in, in around 2008, uh, 
Hunter Thompson and I were going through some of his manuscripts uh, of his books that have been published, and then I I found this manuscript in one of his boxes, and it was called The Rum Diary, and I had heard about it, and I knew it was what they called his long-lost novel, in fact, the only novel he ever wrote. Um, and I showed it to him, and Hunter was, Hunter was shocked. My God, that's where it is, you know. And, and uh, so he said, read me some. So I started reading this to him, and he said, this is a movie. You know, we, we, we must produce this together. And, you know, he got all excited about the, the idea of doing that. So we went right into it, and we started to um, set up meetings to uh, to get to 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 get money uh, financing to develop the project, and uh, we finally ended up getting the money to develop the project and to make the film. Um, Hunter, um, uh, from his own um, dilemmas in his in his life, um, uh, committed suicide, um, and, uh, but I, having had long, long talks with him, I knew every angle of the book, but I knew every angle of the film that he wanted, which was going to be a bit different than the book. And, Bruce Robinson, who was a great writer-director, directed a film called With Nail and I, and How to Get Ahead in Advertising, was the one director that Hunter and I talked about. And so I, I, I went to Bruce, who was a friend of mine, and I ripped him out of retirement because he never wanted to direct another film again. I pulled him out of retirement after 27 years, and uh, he agreed to write the screenplay and direct the film, and uh, we proceeded. Uh, during the auditioning process, um, Bruce, Bruce was, uh, before that, Hunter, Hunter had very specific ideas of what these characters should be. Um, Bruce had been auditioning um, girls or women from for, for the role of Ch uh, Chenault in the film and there were the there were this sort of the starlets that that were up and coming and or there were some that were well known and um, things of that nature but you know one of the things that Hunter was very against was stunt casting that is to say put a bunch of very famous people in a movie and we'll let them go and and then hope for the money in the in the end so bruce had asked me he said he had been auditioning uh this this one particular actress named amber heard um he said that he'd auditioned her five times and he was um He wasn't sure about her capabilities um, as an actress with regard to the film and the character and what and taking direction and that sort of thing. So he asked me if I would read with her for the for the film, and I had met already met a number of actresses and things. And, I, and so what I said to Mr. Robinson is I said, Bruce, I, I, I don't, if you've, if you've auditioned her five times, you've seen the best and the worst, I suppose. So me putting her, this, this girl in an uncomfortable situation, you know, saying, hey, all right, let's read this. I think is a, I think it's a, I think it's a far better idea that we just meet 
so that I can s see how she behaves, um, see how she reacts, because that's really all it is, reaction, behavior. And you don't have to push anything else, you know. Um, so I'm, they made a, an appointment. Uh, she, she came to my office. I took one look at her and I thought, yeah, that's, that's, that's the Chenault that Hunter wants. That's the one. I just, I thought, yeah, she could definitely kill me. That's, uh, that's what Hunter wants. And so we spoke and she was sweet as pie, pleasant, again, you know, um, intelligent, literate very good taste uh, um, and I felt like if she what I felt and what I told Bruce was look when you put, so, when you put someone in a situation that, that, that they're obviously going to be, feel under pressure um, it's not the best way to, to, really, to really know what they're capable of and I made suggestions such as, um, and which I ended up making to Ms. Hurd, I made suggestions of films that might give her uh, uh, some insight into what, what we were looking for in terms of the film. Which is to say, I gave her films like To Have and Have Not, um, and things of that nature, be, 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 because I wanted to, there was something very important that she, I thought, felt she needed to know about stillness as opposed to, you know, uh, going broad or, or, or taking, acting a little too much. So I felt like I could I felt like I could be a bit of a traffic cop in that sense, so that because if we could, if we could connect, then it would it could work as long as there was truth in her eyes, and as long as there was truth coming out of her uh, uh, dialogue, you know, then it's all in the editing. So I I I. I felt that I could help her with that idea of stillness. Um, and so, so that's where I, that's when I first met Ms. Hurd. How would you describe your interactions with Ms. Hurd when you worked together on The Rum Diary? Um, initially, well, yeah, no, mostly very, very, very few interactions. Um, I remember there was a time, I wasn't working that day, but I was producing, you know, one of the producers of the film, <clears throat> and um, it was a scene from the book that, that was, it was a, it was a, it was a scene where Ms. Hurd's character was in a nightclub, and w were amongst, um, the locals, and she's very drunk, and everybody's very drunk, and she ends up dancing with a few of the local, like one of the local guys and stuff, and then the other local guys start to sort of close in on her. In the book and in the screenplay, as it was written, there was a... a she, there was a, required, a requirement for nudity um, for the part. And uh, I was on set the day that they were shooting that. And as I, as I was watching the crowd coming in on her, I realized, you know what? Because I would check on Ms. Hurd and say, are you all right? Are you sure you're OK? Because this is, you know, she was like, no, no, I'm fine, fine, fine. But I realized that with the crowd surging in towards her, 
that we didn't have to do, we wouldn't have to do the nudity. Because if she, if she took, took her shirt off and she had uh, a red bra on um, and a skirt, then if she had a red bra in her hand, when the crowd surged in on her, all she had to do was lift the red bra up out of the crowd and there's no nudity, but it's certainly implied because then she disappears for, the character disappears for a few days and, um, and she's quite a wreck when she comes back because bad things have happened to her. So I, I remember telling Ms. Hurd, hey, you don't, you don't have to, uh, you don't have to take your clothes off, you don't have to take your top off, you don't have to, everything's cool. Um, and she was appreciative. Um, and, uh, but, but, but other than that, we didn't really um, have much interaction until, um, until there was a, um, a scene where I, I was t I'm, I'm taking a shower and then she comes into the room and she walks, opens the shower and we kiss. And uh, that moment was um, it was um, yeah it it, it, it was a, it was it, it felt like something um, it felt like something that I shouldn't be feeling because she had her wife um, and even though it was a scene and, and, and she had her wife and, and I had Vanessa and kitties and um, yeah. When would you say your romantic relationship with Miss Hurt actually began if, if not in that moment? Well. I think there was something in the kiss, in the shower, that was very... and my, uh, for lack of a, well, my wife, uh, we weren't married, married, but she was, of course, my wife, Vanessa. Um, had, we, we had had uh, some not so great 
um, situations, you know, um, she wanted, she needed, she needed, she was stuck in America. <laughs> she wanted to go back to France. She wanted to have her life back. She's a, she's a well-known singer there. She Um, and that's not long out there. Right, right around then is when <clears throat> Miss Heard and I started to uh, see each other here and there occasionally. Uh, between the end of the filming of The Rum Diary and the, the press junket, did you and Miss Heard communicate at any time in between? Mm -mm. I, I don't remember. I remember that there was a, a there was a white dress that she was really she really was infatuated with. That she really loved this dress that she wore in the film, and uh, so I I went to Colleen Atwood, the costume designer, and to Bruce, and I said, "Do you think we can snag this this white dress?" And send it to uh, to Amber, uh, you know, after she'd wrapped, because she loved the she loved the thing. Um, I remember talking to her, I think, then, but uh, briefly, briefly. What did you like about Miss Heard when you first started your romantic relationship? She she seemed to be she seemed to be the um, she, she seemed to be the perfect uh, partner. In, in a sense, f in my head, for me, because she, as I said, she, she was, she seemed to be very knowledgeable about old obscure blues music that I listened to and really liked. Um, she was literate. She was uh, sweet, funny, nice. All those things, you know. Um, and 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 she was. Uh, and from the beginning of our relationship at that time, for a good year, a year and a half, um, she was uh, she was wonderful. And and then things just started to uh, change, or things started to reveal themselves. That's I think is a better way to put it. You mentioned earlier in your testimony that Miss Heard would, would take off your boots when you would get home from work. What, how, what other types of um, behaviors did you observe in Miss Heard early in the relationship? Um, little things that you would kind of, that it would just, the, you'd question in, in, in the back of your mind, you know, if. If uh, if she wanted to go to bed, I'd say, "Oh well, I, I, I can't sleep, you know, right now." And rather than go and just lay in a bed and stare at the ceiling, I would say, I'll, "You know, I'll just watch. I'll be out here watching TV or hanging out." And and that was just not acceptable. Just not acceptable. It would uh, it would steer up some some rather unusual um, reactions from her. I, I I I didn't understand why I, as a fifty some year old man, was not allowed to go to sleep when I wanted to. 
uh, as opposed to when she wanted to. It, it started out with little things like that. And again, they, they just, uh, <clears throat> they eventually, they just, I suppose like anything, if they're allowed to continue, then they, then they are allowed to grow. They're allowed to blossom into whatever they're going to become. What were you and Miss Hurd's nicknames for each other? Um, I called her Slim. Why is that? I called her Slim um, because of the, the film that I had given her to watch like about, in terms of stillness was Lauren Bacall and Humphrey Bogart. And uh, I called her Slim and she called me Steve, which was Lauren Bacall's and Humphrey Bogart's nickname, uh, nicknames for each other in the, in the film. That was their names in the film. Um, and it, it, you know, it wasn't, also wasn't lost on me the fact that uh, there was an age difference and that, uh, um, my God, when, 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 when Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, that's when they met on that film, he was 45 years old and she was 19. Um, and they stayed together until, well, for many years until Bogart passed away. So, yeah, the, 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 the there was a kind of a, joke to not joke but, but just uh yeah i acknowledge the the fact that i was the old craggy bogey and she was this um, um beautiful um um creature just this stunning creature When did you first meet Miss Hurd's parents? I first met Miss Hurd's parents when uh, they they had come out to Los Angeles, I believe, and uh, yeah, and and uh, I feel I feel like that I met them. I think they came to my place to my to, to, uh, to my studio and um, they were two completely opposite ends of the end of the spectrum people page um, was uh, she was an angel she was an angel and uh, and uh, I loved her very much. Uh, I, I, I loved her instantly. And we had a very good relationship. Um, her father, David, was the opposite end of that. He was this outrageous kind of, almost like a cartoon cowboy, you know. And he was, um, the initial thought, I mean, my initial kind of definition for David would have been rascally, like a rascal, you know. Um, but I, 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 I loved. I mean, I grew to love them both very much, uh, as as well as her uh, her sister Whitney. And um, yes, it it felt like I had been welcomed into some sort of family. I had been accepted into this this family, and um, those relationships stayed solid um, until just a bit after we'd uh, separated. How often did you spend time with Miss Hurd's parents during your relationship with Miss Hurd? Quite a lot. Whether we, I, I used to have a boat, um, and we would go. We would take her parents or family, and we'd go sail the boat, and um, you know, 
drop anchor at the island and uh, we would spend a week, two weeks, whatever, on the boat on the island. Um, also, uh, they would come to Los Angeles quite a bit. We also would go to Austin here and there to see them, visit them. Um, every year we would, uh, on their anniversary, um, I had a friend of mine who had a restaurant in Austin, very, like a very good restaurant in Austin, and uh, I'd, I'd call him up and basically, <laughs> basically set it up so that every year on their anniversary they could just go there and and um, they'd be taken care of and there would be no bill so they could just celebrate and I think one of the things we did was yes we, we would try to order them car so that uh, they, were, they could drink um, no, I, 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 I was very fond of them, very fond of them. Now, you mentioned Miss Hurd's sister, Whitney. When did you first meet Whitney? I don't remember exactly when I met Whitney the first time, but I, I've... But I felt when I, when I first met Whitney, there was something in... There was something in what I saw of Whitney that was less, much less confident than Amber. Um, much more um, revealing of insecurities. Um, uh, Objection, Your Honor, just foundation. What he right. saw in Whitney. I think if you could answer the question. Okay. You want to ask the question again? Yeah. I, 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 we can move on. Okay, yeah. that's fine. Um, how would you describe your relationship with Whitney? Great. I mean, fantastic. She was, I called her sis. I loved her, you know. I felt, I had always felt something, I'd always felt like Whitney had missed out on something. Same objection. All right, we can move on. Okay, thank you. Um, wh where was Whitney living when you first, when you and Miss Heard first started your relationship? She was living with her then boyfriend, Sean Krzyzewski. Was this in the same, where was Ms. Hurd living when you first started your relationship? Uh, Ms. Form, uh, Ms. Hurd had informed me that she just moved to a new place on Orange Avenue. What city is that in? Los Angeles, sorry, yeah. And was Whitney also living in Los Angeles? Whitney was living in Los Angeles, yes, with, uh, with uh, Sean Krzyzewski and uh, So how often would you see Whitney um, when you and Miss Heard were in a relationship? Oh, a lot. Um, Whitney, would, uh, Whitney would come over all the time with her boyfriend for dinners and such. Uh, Miss Heard always liked having um, people over, you know, for dinner parties and socially, shows, you know, social kind of events at her, at her, at her place. Have you ever done any drugs with uh, Whitney? Yes. How often would you do that? With Whitney? Yes, with Whitney. Maybe two, two times, three times maybe, twice, three times. Did there come a time when Whitney moved into um, the penthouses that you owned at the Eastern Columbia building? Yes. 
And, and when was that? I don't remember exactly when it was, but I, I uh, do remember that it was after uh, Rocky uh, Pennington and, yes, I believe Josh Drew was there already as well. Um, Whitney, <clears throat> I can't remember why she needed a place, but she uh, needed a place, so we gave her penthouse four to live in. And how long did she live there for? Oh boy, uh, uh, on and off for, uh, I suppose, a couple of years. And how much rent did you charge her? Uh, nothing. Now, you said you did drugs a couple times with, with Whitney. Um, what, what drugs were you doing with Whitney? W Whitney and I had uh, done a, a line or two of cocaine together. When did you start getting introduced to Miss Hurd's friends after you started your relationship with her? Almost immediately. Well, in fact, immediately, yeah. Immediately. I was introduced to uh, the whole gang, you know, Rocky, Io, Brittany Eustace, Whitney, certainly. Um, mm, who else? That, that this all that comes to mind at the moment. No, you, you mentioned Rocky. Uh, who is that specifically? Raquel Pennington, who was Miss Hurd's good friend from uh, youth, I suppose. And I think you mentioned Brittany Eustace as well. Who was that? Um, Brittany Eustace was uh, uh, just one of the gals. You know, she was one of the gals and. Uh, she was quite bubbly and funny and um, real sweet girl, southern, southern girl. I haven't seen her um, in, I, I, think, I, think that there, I think that something went sideways between Brittany Eustis and the girls because she suddenly just disappeared from the group. And when was that? Probably. We were probably uh, a year and a half or two, maybe two, no, two, two years into the relationship, three years maybe. And I believe you mentioned someone named Io. Who is that? Um, Io, Io Tillett Wright was a, a, a friend of Ms. Hurd's from New York City who um, was uh, who, who who had identified as a as a she was born a female, if that's the right terminology these days, born a female, but she was um, she 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 had chosen um, she at a very young age she had decided that. She w was a she was a male, and she identified as a male. Um, and I always seemed to be again. Uh, she was she was uh, very intelligent, very literate, um, kind of a go get 'em kind of activist type, and. Uh, she was writing a book, I remember. She was writing a book, um, Io, or he was writing a book, rather. And um, I, I, I had a house on one of my, on, on Sweetser, one of the houses there was empty. And it was in fact a house that I'd set up to, to write in and uh, when she she had no place uh, to stay or, or go, whatever I, I 
I called her over and I showed her the house, you know, uh, where the desk was and all the things. And uh, so she, I said, write your book, you know, write your book here. So, I, uh, so she, she did. Did Io end up living in that house or just working there? No, no, I, Io ended up, uh, no, she, she ended up uh, living in the house for somewhere in the neighborhood of a year, I guess, somewhere about a year. And how much rent did you charge to Io? Nothing. And did there also come a time when um, Rocky moved into the penthouses at the Eastern Columbia building? Uh, Rocky moved into penthouse two. And do you recall when that was? Oh no, penthouse one. Sorry, penthouse one. That was that was not long after uh, Miss Hurd and I started to uh, begin to dress that place up as our residence. So it wasn't very long after that at all that uh, Rocky and Rocky came. Um, I had already had my friend Isaac, who, who you've met, um, Isaac Baruch, the painter. He, I had already given him a penthouse two to stay in and, and uh, live in and paint in because he had he'd just come back from Florida and uh, his mom had passed away and I think he had about three dollars in his pocket so I, I gave him the penthouse and asked him if he had enough paint and so he lived there. Why did um, Rocky move into the penthouses? Objection uh, foundation. Mm. I'll overrule and, foundation. And hearsay. The question potentially calls for hearsay. Well, I, I don't, I'll overrule that at this moment. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Depp. Um, what, what, why did, uh, sorry, what was it again? Why did Rocky end up moving into the penthouses? Um, she, she, she ended up moving into the penthouses um, I don't recall I, I, I believe it was something to do with just not having a, a, a place and Amber had asked if I would be okay with you know Rocky moving in and I said of course it's a the, the penthouse is empty. I, I, I wasn't in the. Um, I wasn't going to be renting them out necessarily. Anyway, you know, they were for friends to come and stay. I, penthouse four, in fact, was initially planned out for my sister Christy to have an escape from her. 3,000 grandchildren and, uh, and uh, the amount of workload that she had taken on at the company. How long did Miss Pennington end up staying in the penthouses? Longer than I did. And how much rent did you charge to Miss Pennington? Nothing. Did anyone live with Miss Pennington in the penthouses? Yes, her fiance or boyfriend and fiance Josh Drew. Um, and then at a certain point, uh, I learned that there was uh, a, another female living there. Who I, I wasn't sure who that was. I didn't know who that was. It was it because it was a there was it, there were two bedrooms, and so she had invited a friend to move in, but I. I I met that person very briefly a while after they'd already been living there. Okay.